All right, everyone, we're going to get started. Um, we're going to we're going to work with slide rule earth now. Um, the tutorial is going to be given by Scott Henderson and slide rule earth is a way that we can um, process data on demand um, with the algorithms that we want to process it with um, for different kinds of data sets. So Scott's going to tell us a little bit more about that and I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Uh, thanks, Tasha, and thanks everyone for coming to the workshop. So I'm uh, excited to present this next section to you all. It's a collaboration between folks at the University of Washington, where I work, I'm a research scientist there, and software engineers at NASA Goddard. And this is um, a project that's kind of been several years in the making and has, has come a long ways recently and has a lot of exciting functionality that um, those of you working with ISAT2, I think will be particularly excited about. And um, even if you're working with other data sets, there's, there's something I hope for everyone here. So uh, first, maybe just a quick show of hands for people in the room. How many of you work with uh, ISAT2 data? Okay. Good, so quite a few, not everyone. Um, and how many people have have uh, heard of this slide rule software? Okay, and then how many people actually have used it or tried using it? All right, dwindling numbers as we go, <laughs> which is good. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll all use it today. I hope that you will actually run this code as I'm walking through it and modify things. We'll have a bit of time to actually tinker and make some visualizations and um, yeah, try things out. <clears throat> so um, how's the text appearing on the screen bigger? Is that better? Um, okay. I'm also, I'm not actually monitoring the, uh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. So if anyone on, on zoom has questions, we've got people here watching. So just type those into the chat or interrupt. Okay. So on the cryo cloud, um, Jupyter hub. I'm going to navigate into the website folder. You probably maybe are already there from this previous tutorials. Um, under the book folder, tutorials. Um, <clears throat> slide rule applications you'll see a slide rule applications notebook. So that is the notebook we're gonna go over today. And I'm gonna collapse that. Great, so here we are. Hopefully everyone was able to open that. This, uh, this notebook was put together by my colleague, Tyler Sutterly. So I want to give him credit. He he wrote this top to bottom, um, and it's a really excellent kind of one hour overview of a lot of functionality with slide rule. Um, and it, it's really a collaborative effort, um, involving many people, just not my, um, uh, not only myself. So the, the learning objectives here are how, how to use this, especially focused on ISAT2 data. Um, and then also how we can integrate the ISAT2 with other data sets, um, also cloud hosted data sets. So there's a lot of digital elevation models as raster images. Um, and we'll look at those comparisons and then we'll, we'll do some interactive plotting as well. As a quick introduction, slide rule is, um, is a service that runs in Amazon cloud. Uh, as we've heard, you know, there's a lot of NASA data going into this AWS US West 2 data center. There's a massive 
building full of computers where ISAT2 data lives. And we can rent time on those computers to run efficient computations without having to download all this ISAT2 data. <clears throat> so slide rule was designed to enable that really efficient access to generate products on demand and allow you to run some sort of custom algorithms on those products. <clears throat> the data that comes to you as a scientist is, is coming to you in a user-friendly format. And so instead of X-ray, this library returns um, GeoPanda's data frames of photons. So another just quick poll, are people familiar with the GeoPandas library in Python? Some, yes, uh, most yes. And we'll, we'll go over it a bit, but I am assuming a bit of familiarity with, um, <clears throat> with various Python libraries as I walk through this notebook. Um, if there are any that are unfamiliar to, to you, we can definitely talk about it um, throughout the day and um, afterwards. But GeoPandas is sort of a fundamental uh, foundational library I think of for uh, doing any sort of geospatial analysis in Python that's oriented towards vector data. And as we've seen, this ISAT2 instrument returns a bunch of photons, which are point measurements at the Earth, at the, from the surface of the Earth. So they're really kind of, um, I think of them as, as vectors, as a bunch of geospatially located points. Um, that's not true of all the ISAT2 datasets out there. There are gridded um, datasets available, but as sort of a lower level dataset, you're getting points from ISAT2. All right, I slide rule also gives you access to some other datasets such as JEDI, Landsat, Arctic Dem, and RIMA. Um, these are all data that's stored in this same data center and Amazon Web Services. And so we can efficiently run um, computations that query any of those data sets. <clears throat> the um, slide rule module is a set of Python um, sub-modules that are organized by different kind of categories in terms of what, what they do. Um, there's some functionality to query um, the NSIDC, um, which uh, Amy talked us through earlier. Um, there's some functionality to work uh, really efficiently with HDF um, formats um, that's separated into its own H5 Coro submodule. There's a raster submodule for working with this Arctic Dam and Rima data, a JEDI submodule for working with Jedi data sets. You can imagine as more data gets added to these archives, we can kind of add functionality through these different submodules. And uh, a lot of what I'm going to show today is some functionality that's really built around taking advantage of Jupyter Lab. This IPy slide rule uh, allows us to do some interactivity in this Jupyter Notebook interface. So there's a lot of documentation for this project. Um, I encourage you later to, to browse through the full documentation um, and check out the project website. All right. Um, I think Amy's given us a great introduction to ISAT2 as an instrument. So I'm going to skip over kind of the background here and we'll start looking at uh, the code. So, um, We've seen that CryoCloud has a default environment um, with a lot of these libraries already installed. Slide rule is one of those libraries that's already here, already installed when you log in. Um, however, we don't have the latest uh, version of this software installed in the default environment. So you'll often see in some of these tutorial notebooks, the first cell is a command to install a new version of a library. That's what we're going to do here. Um, pip install and slide rule uh, greater than or equal to 4.1. That's the latest release of this software. 
So you get a message there saying you may have to restart the kernel to, to use that package. And the way to do that is up here at the kernel menu, we will go restart kernel. All right. Um, so we can rerun that. That's fine. Um, after you've restarted your kernel and you'll have the, the latest version now. So we're importing uh, these libraries that I mentioned, GeoPandas, and then all of these slide rule submodules that we'll go over bit by bit. And also matplotlib for making plots. So the first step to using this library is to uh, initialize a connection with this slide rule service. So this is a separate server. Um, here is the URL basically of this server, slideroleearth.io. And that's going to connect our notebook computer with this other um, distributed cluster server where the computations are actually going to run. So that basically creates this connection to a distributed computing configuration for us. The next kind of first step is uh, specifying a request to this server for the processing we want to perform. Um, the kind of initial implementation of slide rule was to customize generation of surface segment fitting to the ATL03 photon data that we saw an example of earlier. So you get these really dense photon clouds along six different laser beams as the ISAT2 altimeter is, is measuring Earth's surface as it, as it orbits. Uh, and we want to extract surfaces from those photon clouds. because so a lot of times we're interested in the um, elevation change over time. And so for that step, we have to extract the elevation along the track of um, this altimeter. The way you do that is you have these moving windows um, of different segment lengths, and you extract surfaces across maybe 40 meter segments is the standard segment length. But you might want to change that. You might have um, crevassed areas where a shorter segment length makes more sense. So you want to drop down to 20 meter segments uh, along the track, or maybe you want to run a really coarse analysis and you want to increase that segment length to 200 meters. So this is kind of the fundamental uh, <clears throat> rationale behind development of this tool is that the standard products don't always fit all use cases, and you may want to tinker with those uh, parameters that are used to generate the standard products. So there are a number of kind of these parameters that we can tinker with. You can um, select different parameters for photon classification. So which photons will we use to, to make a surface extraction from? How long each of these segments should be? Um, and that's determining how many of these photons were kind of collapsing down to a single surface measurement. For this, we can use this IPI slide rule widgets functionality, um, which gives us this kind of interactive selection of all the variables that are available to us to change. Um, here, we're, we're starting these widgets, initializing them with the defaults. So defaults are always a good place to start, um, but this also allows you to make fewer mistakes in terms of um, not typing in um, you know, an option that's not actually available. And you can see, you can kind of interactively see which options are available to you. So we'll just start with the defaults there, this 40 meter length that I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> and we'll set up a interactive map um, 
where we're going to run our processing. So we've seen earlier working with these GeoJSON files. Um, it's a nice way to just kind of specify your um, area of interest. So often workflows will start with one of these files, which will be a simple polygon enclosing our area of interest. Uh, we add this to a map. So we're going to look at elevations over Grand Mesa, Colorado for this demo. And one tip is that you can right click on a Jupyter cell and use this create new view for output. This is a nice feature <clears throat> when you're plotting results on these kind of interactive maps. I'm just going to leave that off to the side and continue going down this notebook. Notebooks are very linear, but you're often wanting to kind of like go back up to a plot you previously created. So I find this separate view for specific figures to be kind of a really handy thing. Um, all right, so now is the fun part. We, we've specified our parameters, uh, which include an area of interest, a photon uh, a length, segment length, and a photon classification type. Now we can run some requests through slide rule, which will retrieve all these elevations for us. So the way we do that is we set up a parameters dictionary. We um, here are just taking a precaution to, to clear any um, previous runs we've done. And um, <clears throat> we're going to iterate over uh, polygons we've specified. So this is coming from our map. If we go back up, M1 regions is back up here. This is an IPy leaflet map, um, which is another library that's uh, just very useful for visualizations with Python. And the request to slide rule is actually happening here. Um, slide rule ISAT2, because we're working with this ISAT2 data, and we've submitted our request parameters to the server. So this returns um, basically a, a list of geodata frames of all the photons from all the ATLO3 granules that we've processed. So I didn't output all the log here, but if we print out this data frame, you can see this ran in 10 seconds. You'll see that we've, we've retrieved 300,000 uh, records, records being photon elevation estimates um, along these segments. So um, it's a little bit, I think this is actually really neat, but a lot of it's kind of behind the scenes. <laughs> this is actually hitting a lot of different files of these HDF files hosted um, by NSIDC in these S3 buckets, but extracting kind of the raw data, running this algorithm given your segment length, and then returning hundreds of thousands of kind of elevations in just a few seconds. And the reason we're able to do that is because we're we're launching a bunch of machines to run through all those files in parallel. So the alternative is kind of find in individual files, maybe work with them one at a time, uh, figure out which groups you need to get into and open and, and do this kind of in a more manual way. So these records, you can see each one of these is a point. Each point tells you a lot of different information, including the number of, of photons that actually went into this fit for you. Um, the mean elevation, so that's that elevation extraction we were interested in, and then other parameters, which I'm not going to go into detail for. So finally, we can 
these geo data frames are quite easy to put onto maps and visualize. Um, so let's go ahead and do that. Uh, this is another widget that kind of allows you to play with different color maps and things. So for example, um, well, I'll just start with the default and uh, the code here, I'm not going to go over in detail, but um, it will apply basically this color mapping we've specified to the data frame and put it onto this map. So here we can see our results. We're plotting uh, you know, a maximum of 10,000 points. Yeah, it's just uh, a little more efficient to give quick overviews of your results that way, rather than trying to plot all 300,000. Um, but you can see here the coverage of ISAT2. Now this is um, several years worth of data and any one of these kind of tracks of points um, plus the elevations over Grand Mesa up to 3,000 meters here. All right. If you want to create elevation plots along profile for any one of these ground tracks, you can also do that. Um, <clears throat> here, we're picking a specific repeat, repeat ground track, um, and we're picking one of the beams from this ground track, beam three. Um, the cycle is basically keeping track of the orbits over time as this mission goes forward. So those are the things we would select um, to plot a profile. And then there we have it. So this is one of the profiles um, along one of the tracks on the map here. And you can kind of see in the elevations um, going up to the top of the Mesa up at 3,000 um, meters. So another thing you can do, this one of the neat features of these kind of IPy leaflet visualizations is they're, they're linked. So if we click on, this is a little hard to see, um, click on one of these cycles. You can see hovering over the photons, you see, um, uh, yeah, cycle ground track, repeat, repeat ground track number. So this is 272 at this point. Sorry. Maybe this isn't actually working. <laughs> In theory, uh, you can click on one of these points and these selections down here will change. I don't know if that works for anyone. It did. Okay. Yeah. So they're sort of linked, um, but you can, yeah, click on those. These should change, but if you change these values here um, and rerun this plotting cell, you'll, you can plot different profiles. Um, based on your results. Another way to do that would be to go back up to your data frame and just find the repeat ground track um, numbers you're interested in up here. All right. Um, so go ahead and try that. Try just like plotting another profile, maybe show it to your neighbor. Um, but yeah, let's see if we can just all select a different profile to plot. Might close this.
Cool. So any, any questions about how that, uh, how that all worked? Yep. Yeah, it's a good question. You don't need a, a GeoJSON file. The question was, um, do you always have to supply a, a GeoJSON file for your area of interest, or can you just do a simple bounding box? Um, and you can. If you look through the documentation, uh, which I'll go back up to show you where that is. Um, yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, so the, I'm searching in the slide rule documentation here for region, which we were specifying, um, and I think you have to drill down a bit, uh, Yeah, polygons. Okay, um, so in the documentation here, there's like a kind of an overview of the different ways you can input those values. If you manually wanted to input a few latitude, longitude uh, bounds, you could do it this way. Um, yeah, it generally is kind of easier, in my opinion, to do the GeoJSON file. And then it's also nice because you can share that with a colleague quite easily. So a nice way to generate these files. If folks haven't seen it, there's a website called geojson.io. Um, and this allows you to just kind of like zoom in anywhere in the world and create a geojson that you can, you can save. And so this is like just a super easy way to to create these things. It could be polygons too, right? Or boxes. So we find ourselves often using this and then using that file going forward. Okay. Um, great. Well, this, I think it did, it's just very slow maybe to select a point on that map uh, to, to change these values, but it did work for me um, to select a different repeat ground track and plot that profile. So that's good. All right. And this next example will showcase a bit of the functionality around raster sampling in addition to generating these ISAT2 based elevations. So um, we can change the segment length of these fits like we saw. We can also select um, some external data sets to add to our returned data frame. Uh, with values to compare our photon segments against. So in this example, we're gonna uh, we're gonna sample a digital elevation model at the locations of our calculated ISAT2 elevations. Um, there are links to the documentation on um, <clears throat> yeah, that uh, I encourage you to read over after the fact. Um, another neat thing we'll see with this example is you can you can use different projections um, for these leaflet maps and for the returned coordinate reference of um, your geodata frames. So when working in the polar regions, um, by default, a lot of these web maps that use uh, Google Mercator coordinate reference, it's not really good for your scientific analysis to use that system. Um, it's better often to use a, when you're working in the polar regions, a polar stereographic projection. Um, reason being is that you often want your kind of like X and Y aspects to be equal. Um, so distance in X is equivalent, one meter in X is equivalent to one meter in Y directions. It's an easy way to think about it. Um, all right. So this example here is looking at Fenris Glacier in Greenland. And because we're in Greenland, we're going to use a Northern Hemisphere 
over stereographic projection. And we're also going to query the Arctic, um, Arctic DEM data set uh, to get uh, raster elevations sampled at the points we're interested in. So here again, we're using a GeoJSON file to define our region of interest. <clears throat> And you can see when we've initialized our plot, we're um, specifying that we're working in a north um, polar stereographic projection. So if we zoom out, um, this is this is pretty neat, I think, for working in the polar regions. You can kind of view these different map layers in a more natural projection. So here is our polygon for the region we're interested in, and uh, with coarse elevations kind of as a base map. All right. I'm going to change a few other parameters. Um, here we have options to change the photon classification type to use for our fitting. Um, there are a lot of options. Uh, my favorite is YAPSI, which stands for Yet Another Photon Classification Algorithm. Uh, but there are others and I, I don't, I'm no expert in, in these, uh, but I encourage you to explore those. Um, you may be interested in different kind of confidence levels of these classifications, whether or not a photon is classified as coming from land, ocean, sea ice, land ice, or inland water. Um, also, uh, confidence level related to whether or not a, a photon is actually a reflection off the surface of the earth or if it's uh, background just emissions of, of photons from the sun and um yeah other classifications depending on which of these algorithms you're using so we'll use the defaults again you can see that as you set up kind of these different queries, there are more parameters available to you. Um, but this is something you can return to and read up on these parameters in the documentation to understand exactly what they do. Starting with the defaults, I think is good. So we're going to, again, request these ATL06 uh, surface elevations, um, but with a different set of parameters. This is a key next kind of feature is that we're going to, to this set of parameters, we're saying to slide rule, please go retrieve these values for me. Uh, we're adding a samples um, key and we're specifying that we want to sample the Arctic DM mosaic with a radius of uh, 10 meters. So for every photon, uh, surface extraction that's returned to us, we're going to sample this raster DM in a 10 meter buffer and take kind of the zonal stats from that raster and put that into our table of results. So the same, um, same sort of approach here, uh, we're looping just in case you have multiple, uh, GeoJSON polygons. In this case, we only have one. Uh, and we're submitting this ISAT2 request uh, by passing this dictionary of parameters. We got some responses back saying uh, we're using a simplified polygon. So you can come back up and see this polygon we submitted was uh, a little too jagged for NASA's liking. And so we had to reduce the number of points to make it a simpler uh, area to query. So that's what that warning is telling us. Uh, but again, it, yeah, question. Yeah, good question. So the, so the question is this error about the polygon being to, uh, needing to be simplified. Is there a way to control how that is simplified? Um, I'm not actually sure the answer to that. Yeah, yeah, you can you can um, do that yourself. Uh, the documentation should cover how this is actually done in detail, but you can see we've gone from uh, 
a, to a starting total of 457 vertex points on this polygon down to 73. And, uh, and I don't think, I wonder if that simplified polygon is actually returned. I'm not sure it is. That would be a good thing to, to have returned. Um, but yeah, short answer is you, you could, <laughs> you could do that as kind of a pre pre step rather than letting the server do it for you. But it's a good question. I, I should say too, that, uh, you know, all the, the code for this system is also just on GitHub. It's all open. So there's no magic really behind the scenes. So the algorithm for the simplification is, is there and we can find it. And as also as sort of an open source project, I'm very curious from anyone in the room, if there are any of these things or these questions that come up of, um, how to make it easier or like something that doesn't work, uh, is something we can work on fixing. Um, so keep these questions in mind and definitely keep them coming. So that, uh, gave us a new geo data frame, um, this GDF two, and we can add these points just as we did before to a map. So this will add the results to the map, um, that we created earlier. So we go back up to scroll back up to that map and you'll see just like we did earlier except now we're in a different um, projection. We can also create a uh, static map. So this is more, you know, more polished kind of final map. If you're putting something together for like a publication, um, instead of using the interactive leaflet map, we're using matplotlib here. And um, I'm not gonna go over all the code in detail, but we'll just look at um, the result. <clears throat> oh yeah. And actually I wanna show, just gonna add a cell here. The results came back in this um, geodata, GDF2, geodata frame two. And if you scroll all the way over to the right, you'll see some new columns compared to the first example we ran. And those new columns are reflecting our zonal stats sampling of the raster data set. So we have mosaic um, count, which is the number of pixels from that Arctic Dem raster we've sampled. Uh, and then the, um, the maximum value, the median, the standard deviation from that raster. So it's quite easy to compare our Arctic Dem median sample against our ISAT2 height mean sample. So this is where now we just have these already aligned points and we can do differences of those different columns to visualize the elevation difference between these data sets. So that's sort of the, the user interface design of, of how slide rule gives you these results back. And um, here we're plotting those differences. So we have the ISAT2 uh, slide rule elevations on the left, the Arctic Dem uh, mosaic elevations on the right, and then the difference um, <clears throat> slide rule minus Arctic Dem. Does anyone work uh, in this particular area? And do these elevations seem reasonable, these elevation differences? Could be maybe a, it's a, it's an area I've, I'm not familiar with. So, um, yeah, one, one thing, oh, sorry. Did someone have something to say online? Maybe not. Um, yeah. So one thing I noticed is that the, these, um, stronger elevation differences are um, 
in the valleys, I think where this glacier is compared to kind of the bedrock areas or more mountainous areas where you have minimal elevation differences, uh, it would be good to know for these Arctic Dem raster measurements, what's the timestamp of those measurements? I'm not sure what those are. Um, you know, it's a, it's a mosaic of a bunch of different raster elevations. Um, but the timestamps on ISAT2 are very precise. We know exactly at what time the elevations from ISAT2 were coming back to us. So there's some more digging you'd have to do here, I think. But uh, we're looking at, I think, you know, the elevation drop over time. Um, and we're kind of doing this rather quickly. You could imagine going across to... Uh, any glaciers of interest and kind of repeating this analysis and interpreting these results. Any questions about that section? The raster sampling? Yeah. Yes, on that question, the graph is really well Yeah, there is functionality to query the strips, the the raster strips that go into making the mosaic. Um, that's another feature that's sort of added there where you can get exact time-stamped rasters from Arctic Dem or Rima. The requests take much longer because you're reading over, I think, potentially a lot of files. Um, but that's one way to go about it. The question was, whether you could read into the individual files comprising the mosaic, if I understood correctly. Oh. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, so there's some... Um, Shawnee was pointing out that the mosaic itself, in addition to the elevation value, has a count of number of timestamps going into that pixel. Yeah. And I'm not sure, to be honest, off the top of my head, I'd have to read. I know that data set was updated relatively recently, the Arctic Dem and, and Rima, uh, but that would be a great thing to add if it's not already in there. <laughs> Definitely would be good. All right. Um, so just a couple more. So yeah, another question. Yeah. Um, yes, the defaults are set to be pretty much the same as the standard ATL06 product. Um, so the the segment length, for example, by default is 40 meters. Um, but yeah, you can reduce that. Yep. Okay. Um, great. Well, just a couple more relatively quick examples, I think. Um, so this uh, ISAT-2 mission also has applications beyond cryosphere studies. Um, these photon clouds give you can give you estimates of, of canopy height. Um, so instead of extracting kind of the bare earth surface or glacier surfaces, we can also look at um, canopy heights in forested areas. Um, so there is a set of metrics um, uh, called FORIAL coming from the University of Texas to, to do this measurement. Um, and um, they're one of the classification algorithms that we saw earlier was this um, ATL08 vegetation height product classification scheme. And so this is classifying photons as a photon reflection coming from surface or water or canopy. And so this is a nice um, 
classification scheme if you are interested in um, looking at canopy heights. So we'll take a look at 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 this again, um, this Grand Mesa area, and we've changed the tile base map to be coming from Esri get satellite imagery rather than the um, rather than roads. And this is nice because it's kind of showing you where the forested areas are versus grasslands, gives you that context for your analysis. And we're changing our parameters again here to use a different classification scheme uh, than we've used previously. This foreal algorithm also has its own kind of custom parameters. Um, which, uh, again, I won't have time to go over in detail, but you can read more in the documentation about what all those parameters are. And again, we can kind of display the set of widgets showing us the range of these parameters and what we can select. Um, I will leave this all at the defaults and submit a request. There's a key kind of difference here to what we're submitting and you'll notice that um, instead of the ATL06 endpoint to slide rule, we're specifying a new um, endpoint, which is the ATL08 uh, endpoint. So behind the scenes, this is basically calling a different kind of uh, server endpoint or URL and then returning these results to us. But as a user, you're sort of working with the same thing, which is this geodata frame of returned results. Here we have just 27,000. Um, and we can put these on a map. Curious if anyone, I think everyone attending this workshop is mostly focused on cryospheric studies, maybe not as interested in, in the canopies, but anyone in the room working with faux real or canopy heights? Nobody in the room <laughs> or online. Yeah, this is, I'm also, this is not really an area that I'm familiar with, but um, just qualitatively, we can kind of look at these results that we've gotten back for canopy height from slide rule um, against the kind of base map. So just zooming in on a, maybe on our map above, you can see at least zoomed out our canopy heights ranging from zero um, up to 30, 30 meters. Uh, which seems kind of reasonable for <laughs> tall trees, 30 meters, a big tree. Um, and then kind of zooming in here, you'd expect maybe these grassland points to be the lower values compared to where you've got denser forest. The might just skip on it. Oh, there we go. The map is uh, kind of slow to to render. Uh, part of that is actually like just the the Wi-Fi because you're having to bring these results ultimately back to your laptop screen, I think, but uh, yeah, but there we go. Yeah, you can kind of see uh, 
at least call it, you know, just qualitatively looking at this base map, I think kind of the lower elevation canopy heights compared to once you get into the, the greener, uh, different vegetation classes. So something to explore if you are interested in bringing a vegetation analysis into your studies. All right. And then finally, um, I'll just show kind of our last demo, which is working directly with these uh, photon cloud data sets. So the ISAT2 standard product this relates to is ATLO3. Um, and this is sort of the foundational data from ISAT2, all these other standard products, ATLO6, ATLO8, um, are derived ult ultimately from this photon cloud. So it's, it's easy here to get into the territory of, um, very large data frames, um, where you're potentially returning billions of points from these files. Um, so just something to be aware of, even though there's a lot of scalability to this system, um, it tends to be um, easier starting out with smaller areas rather than trying to like draw your polygon for the entire US or, you know, all of Greenland. That is possible, um, but I'll speak to that kind of like at the very end. Um, for now, uh, just going back to Fenris Glacier, here we're going to change our endpoints again to the ATLO3 endpoint. So slide rule is structured by having all these different endpoints depending on which data set from NSIDC you're working with. And um, what we're going to do is, is not only re return the surface extraction, but return all the photons. Um, and that way we can plot you know, all the original photons and then the surface we're extracting as well. That's one reason you might want to do this. Here we're changing the length to 20 meters. Um, and so that's one one change compared to the default, uh, the ATLO six default. <clears throat> so, um, yep, this simplifies our polygon again because we're working with the the glacier polygon. And if we look at the records that we've returned for this polygon, we have three hundred thousand records, and. Um, Again, this includes sort of all the photons, and we can make a plot now of all these photon heights, um, which I will show here with this call. Um, you'll notice that we have a few kind of pre-canned plotting routines. These are just for common visualizations that people often want to look at. Uh, this one is showing these like these ATLO three photons the surface extraction, and the different classifications of those photons. So I'm going to zoom out a little bit so you can see this whole thing. Uh, well, sorry. There we go. Having trouble fitting it all on the screen, but... You get the idea here, I think. Um, uh, again, we're plotting the, the classification of a photon and also um, low, medium, and high competence intervals of uh, surface extraction. Yeah, and a key thing, these background photons are... Um, ones that are emitted from the sun are coming from some source other than what ISAT2 actually emits and then is returned to the satellite from a reflection off the surface of the Earth. So there's always a lot of these background photons that are part of this ATLO3 data set. And um, this is what these surface fitting algorithms have to deal with somehow in, in order to get an accurate surface extraction.
think we're just about out of time. So there's just one more short example, which is um, an efficient read of an existing file. So another um, approach you might have is maybe you've done an analysis or, or you're working with a few very specific files. Um, we saw from Amy earlier how you can use Earth, Earth Access or NASA's Earth Data Search to find the specific files you're interested in for a given area. So these um, ATLO 6 HDF files. And one other feature of slide rule is you can kind of uh, use more, more of these like fundamental endpoints that the server is using to read these files efficiently. Um, so for example, if we wanted to read uh, ATLO 6 file and specific beams from that file, we can also use this H5 endpoint to do that for us. So rather than kind of searching for a given area of interest and finding all the files and then iterating over them and giving us the results, this is made to simplify. You already know the file you want to work with. Just give me the, give me the values from that file. So this is quite similar to what we saw with um, the IcePix library, for example, except we're um, getting our results back in this uh, <clears throat> geodata frame format. And here we're plotting the ground tracks um, for a specific uh, region or for, for the full file. So this is another just feature of slide rule is it has both these kind of efficient reading um, routines built into it that the server will run for us behind the scenes, or you can call those routines directly if you know the file in advance. And that's, um, that's about it for the overview. There's a lot more to it. I mentioned there are these other data sets you can query, um, which I think is pretty interesting, like the harmonized Landsat Sentinel or other things. So if you're ultimately, if you're wanting to work with ISAT2 points, I think this is a good um, tool to use to let you to intercompare with other data sets. Uh, there is a public version of this. Uh, cluster. So you'll you'll notice at the very beginning of this notebook, we connected to this slide rule earth.io. And we have this kind of public cluster, just like CryoCloud allows all of us to log in and launch a bunch of machines. Um, slide rules set up the same way. Uh, there's a single computing resource that we all are using when we're running these commands. Um, but there's also a way to set up kind of separate clusters. So if your research group is needing to process like all all data of green covering Greenland or all of Antarctica, these are the sorts of kind of the scale of analysis where you benefit from not uh, using that that public cluster that everyone's dependent on, but setting up a dedicated one for that scale of analysis. So that's something um, that's explains in this final section. Um, but uh, I think that's that's a good ending point for this tutorial. And so, yeah, thanks for attending. And uh, I'm around the rest of the day to answer questions about this. Are there any questions while we get set up with the next tutorial? Yeah, yeah. The question was, do you, you know, do you have to be sort of on the cloud to run this? Um, and and no, you don't because the slide rule clusters are are there. So you could run the same notebook from your laptop. Um, yeah, and that would work. Okay. Yep.